We're returning to the States for this episode, slowly making our way back to the New York women. But first, we've a stop in Ohio and D.C. for a combined episode. Alice and Laura Barney. More straight women? Straight women frequented our world of Paris Lesbos. I guess. Fair enough. Whatever. Born January of 1857 in Cincinnati, Alice Barney is known mainly as the mother of Natalie, the woman who continually pops up all over our podcast, sometimes when she's least expected. She's the daughter of a Jewish immigrant businessman who made a fortune in whiskey and built up the Cincinnati arts scene, including the Opera House, which was considered the most magnificent entertainment venue west of the Allegheny Mountains. So, a significant family. In the state of Ohio, yes. Hey, don't knock Ohio. We are friends to Ohio on this podcast. So we are. Now, unfortunately, Sam Pike, Alice's father, died without warning in 1872 of a massive heart attack during an oyster lunch. So not that Jewish. You are the authority on Jews and oyster lunches here? I'll just say that he wasn't keeping kosher, and that maybe people were a bit more secular um, than often we expect people of the past to have been. True. He was only 50 years old. That must have been really rough for her. Yes, she was 15, and of the four children, she took his death the hardest, because of how close they were. For a time, she wouldn't sing, play piano, or do art at all, hobbies she'd shared with her father. Within a year, things did return to normal, and a grand European tour was planned to get away from the city. I'm sure getting away from the place where she'd spent a lot of time with her father might have been a good way of kind of moving on. It was. The first stop, naturally, was Paris, which intrigued Alice the most, watching artists dressed all in black arguing in cafes. It was during this time that she started to sketch. The next stop was London where she met the explorer Henry Morton Stanley. Ah, now haven't we heard his name before? Who is this Stanley? He was already famous for finding Dr. Livingstone on a journey in Africa. He would later explore and map the source of the Nile before working for King Leopold II of Belgium and being knighted by the English king in 1899. Oh, nice, except for the Belgium. Man, why does Leopold keep on turning up? Because we're in the high society circles. I guess, and you can't avoid him. Now, for Stanley, meeting Alice was a lightning bolt, despite the fact that he was 33 and she was 17. Oof, not sure I like that age gap. Yes, and this was also despite his initial mixed feelings towards her for wearing too many diamonds and having a lack of education on African geography. Mm, so it was more about her... her manners than necessarily her conversation itself. Particularly, it was her charm and elegance. Mm -hmm. He was soon contemplating marriage. Was she? She was flattered by the attention. After all, at the time, Stanley was considered the lion of London for exploits and with the promise of a great career ahead of him. He could have been talking to any woman. Ooh. Wow. So... Something was happening there, then. Yes, it, something was happening, and Alice's mother was alarmed by it. <laughs> Understandably, again, 17. When Stanley asked for the teenager's hand, her mother refused. She felt that Alice was too young, so Stanley agreed to wait. The trip continued, and the Pikes returned to the U.S. While Alice was thinking about Stanley... He was off pining across the ocean. Oh, I was just going to say, did they have any way of, like, connecting with each other, contacting each other during this time, or was it too cumbersome to send letters that far? No, they were definitely exchanging letters, even as Stanley embarked on another African trip. During this time, he carried her photo, named his boat Lady Alice, and named a set of rapids Rapids Alice. He wrote her practically every day. Oh. That's so sweet. And yet, when we talk about Natalie Barney, her last name is not Natalie Stanley. 
It is most definitely not. Meanwhile, during all of this, Alice's mother was concerned that she'd actually marry Stanley or some New York playboy she'd been talking to at social events. So she packed her family up and off to Dayton, Ohio, a city north of Cincinnati, where they had relatives. Alice was introduced to Albert Barney by her aunt when she stepped off the train in the latest European fashion. Oh. Now, for his part, Alice met Albert's list of marriage qualifications. Rich heiress, traveled, pretty, vivacious, and a petite figure that flattered his height. Now, when you say flattered his height, does that mean he was short? Shorter than average. I see. I don't get why people have this thing about the the man has to be taller than the woman, but whatever, we'll hope this doesn't speak to his character. Well, what we see first of his character is him sending bouquets, chocolates, and books to her, taking her out riding and accompanying her around the social scene. Alice, for her part, enjoyed his company, but didn't think that this was a courtship. (laughs) Historical friend zone. This is made even more obvious when Albert proposed, and it was not helped by how he did it. Oh no, what does that mean? Well, I ask you this. If a man started saying something about not having a silver platter and offering with his two bare hands, what would you think he was talking about? I have no idea. She had no idea either. But out of politeness, she said, and I may accept it with my own two bare hands. Mm -hmm. Because she's trying to make him feel at ease. Like Like a nice girl, which she is. She is, and she was very startled when he immediately kissed her. Mm Mm-hmm. He then ran away shouting to all of her relatives within earshot that they were engaged, and everyone proceeded to congratulate them. Oh my god, this is so embarrassing. It was. She was too embarrassed to say anything at all. (laughs) No! Poor woman. Oh no. Later that night, she thought about calling it off but she decided to go through with it. As she reasoned, she was fond of Albert and didn't think she'd ever love anyone, so why not marry him? Well, but what about Stanley? Stanley gets the short end of this stick in this story. Alice and Albert are married a few days shy of her 19th birthday. Stanley is still in Africa at this time. In fact, he receives notice in a letter about her marriage at the same time that a newspaper arrived announcing the birth of her oldest daughter, Natalie. Oof, that poor guy. It said Stanley's hair turned white overnight at the news. Yeah, I understand. Now, just clarification, um, how old was Albert at this time? Approximately seven years older than Alice. So he's like 26. So he's, like, slightly younger than Stanley, but not not super young. I just, that seems so young for her to be getting married. I would like to point out all the stories of socialites over the years, and them all being married by the time they're 20, 21. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess it was just different times. Now, on Alice's part, it took her six months to realize she'd made a mistake. Albert found Stanley's letters in one of her trunks and flew into a rage. She said they meant nothing and that she hadn't even read the most recent ones. He demanded she burn all of them. Oh my god, sorry, that's that's just such a controlling thing for him to do. As we'll see, Albert was quite controlling for appearance's sake. She complied in doing this. He then kissed her hair, called her a good wife for doing so, and walked away. He never trusted her after that, and proceeded to start calling Stanley his rival. Oh my god, dude, you got married to her. Like, is that not good enough? Apparently not. Alice now realized she should have married Stanley, but she was stuck. Divorce wasn't an option, and she was pregnant. So she can't just leave him? No, she can't. Partly because she's pregnant and partly due to the social conventions and moral attitudes and even laws 
in place at the time. Mm-hmm. Right, I mean, if she did just, like, up and go to Africa with Stanley, his reputation would be ruined, too, and she would never be able to mix with polite society. I could see that that would... She She's really painted herself into a corner here. She really has. And her first daughter, Natalie, is born on Halloween of 1876. Another, Laura, arrives in 1879 after they moved to Cincinnati from Dayton, where Albert's family owned a railroad car factory. Did she resent having these children by this husband who was so awful to her, or do we know anything about this? I don't know of any resentment she had. I think she just liked having Albert around so much. But remember when we said earlier that Alice could never conceive of herself as loving a person? Mm -hmm. Even her relatives commented on her engagement something along the lines of, I can't see Alice loving anyone. Wow. It turns out, Alice can in fact love people. Mm -hmm. Namely her children. Aww. Though she wasn't a physically affectionate woman. She rarely hugged her children, and they were taken care of day-to-day by servants and governesses. Well, we have the the proper society lady role to uphold here. Yes, being the perfect wife on Albert's arm for several years. I do also have to wonder how much postpartum depression, for what might have been a couple of years, had to do with it, because Natalie remembers prior to her sister's birth, her mother playing piano and singing operatic arias. Mm, so part of her kind of distant affection might have to do with stuff going on in her own brain. Quite possibly. And this cycle of being the perfect society wife continues until a run-in with Oscar Wilde on a North Atlantic beach in 1882. May we all have a run-in with Oscar Wilde on a North Atlantic beach in 1882. Wilde at the time was on a North American tour and staying at the same seaside resort. Their first encounter mainly was due to him saving Natalie from a bunch of boys who were chasing after her and possibly pelting her with raisins or some sort of fruit. Uh, He had picked her up and was telling her a story he invented on the spot when Alice found them. Oh, good. This is queer solidarity right here, and neither of them know it. Yes. Now, the next day, or a few days later, he flopped down beside Alice on the beach while she watched her children play, and proceeded to have a life-altering conversation with her. They talked about Stanley, Albert, and basically life. She seemed to not quite know what to do, because she sort of repeated herself quite a bit. It was as if her brain was rebooting itself. I'm sure it would have been a lot to process. I mean, all, all of the stuff that she had been doing and the pressure that she was under and the facade that she had to put up. Now, did she know that Oscar Wilde was gay? Did this feel like an affair sort of thing? Or, or what was her interpretation? Do we know? And no, no. This was a very intimate conversation with two practically strangers who might as well have become close acquaintances over one day. Mm-hmm. He then invited her to go swimming early next morning with half of the Victorian covering swimsuit left behind, and namely the skirt, shoes, and stockings. <gasps> no, then the legs will be on view. Yes, all the scandal. If you're having trouble picturing what this would have looked like, I would describe it as stripping down to something that looks more like a modern one-piece swimsuit. The horror. Albert, it should be noted, was due to arrive later that day after the swim. Mm, terrifying. Unfortunately for Alice, she broke her toe in the surf, and Wilde had to carry her back to her room and get the doctor. If this were anyone else, this would read like a romance novel, <laughs> like a really trashy one. It is not a romance novel. This is actually the last time they would ever see each other. Mm-hmm. His last words to her on his way out the door were, Joy is consummation and is its own end. Adios, Madame Alice. Oh, Oscar. (laughs) That's beautiful. She was left contemplating her bandaged toe and wondering how to keep Albert in the dark about swimming 
half dressed with a mad Englishman. Yeah, because if she was like that with Stanley, whose letters he had discovered, then what would he be like with this guy who had been touching her legs? Probably a great deal worse, but as she said, it was worth it. Mm -hmm. This marked a change in her. Now 26, Alice returned to art and took up painting. First China painting in Cincinnati, and later portrait painting. Now, having been in Cincinnati, um, and being aware somewhat of the ceramic arts scene, was she involved with any particular, like, company or, like, pottery organization, guild? I don't know. Or was she just doing this kind of on her own? So since you asked, do you know about a Rookwood pottery? Yeah, that was right by my work. That's if anyone's in Cincinnati, they should go to Rookwood Pottery. Um, they should go. It, they have like a display room. Um, everything is pretty pricey, but it's gorgeous. Um, and they are like a historic Cincinnati pottery place. So wow. So she was involved with them. Yes, they offered classes and the use of a kiln to local residents, and that's where Alice learned china painting. Oh my goodness. In 1887, she traveled to Paris to be nearer her two daughters while they attended a French boarding school. While there, she studied painting with Carolus Duran, a French painter who later did portraits of her daughters. Ooh, how did Albert feel about this man in her life? Albert agreed to this because it allowed him to go to London and live a bachelor lifestyle. Now, what does that mean? Well, Albert does not appear to have been monogamous to Alice, and he quite enjoyed hanging around his clubs, one of which included the Alibi Club, so named because it provided men with an alibi if their wives came looking for them. For instance, women were only allowed entry once a year for a Thanksgiving tea, and there were no phones. Any woman who wanted to reach her husband on the premises could do so only by telegram. If she was foolish enough to come in person, she would automatically be told by the butler that her husband wasn't there, whether he was or not. Furthermore, if she asked the butler whether he had been in the club on a certain day and at a certain time, he would automatically say yes. Wow. This is... I hate this so much. This club is designed to ruin marriages. Um, And also, Albert is such a hypocrite. And he didn't really realize that his daughters were watching him be one, which explains their later behavior towards monogamy and marriage. It should also be noted, if anything went wrong with the children at the French boarding school, Alice was only a short train trip away from them. So that's good, at least. Like, like yeah, their father is completely shirking all responsibility, but at least their mother's there. And then Albert announced they were moving to Washington, D.C., as he'd inherited $5 million dollars with both his parents dead. That is about $90 million in modern U.S. dollars. With the recent inflation, it's possible it topped $100 million in today's money. So, nothing to sneeze at. Nothing at all. He ordered a new house built in D.C. and a summer cottage of 26 rooms in Maine. Wow. As- so, but what about, what about the um, kids in their boarding school and Alice and her art stuff? Well, as a consequence, Alice's learning and mixing with artists was cut short, and the children were brought back to the U.S. for a time. Mm -hmm. They did attend an American boarding school at one point, though there were problems. Laura, for instance, at one point was in the hospital for pain in her leg, that eventually resolved itself, but she was kept out of the boarding school for a while. Now, with Alice's artwork, she persisted and proceeded to silence everyone who thought she was wasting time when she won a commission in 1891 to paint an official portrait of former Secretary of State John C. Calhoun. Oh, wow. How that worked when the man had been dead since 1850 must have been interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought about how how the timelines worked out there. So what did she do? I imagine she had to look at old portraits as photography only started to reach the masses at about the same time the man died. Yeah, interesting. So a picture of a picture. Either way, the portrait then appeared in the 1893 Chicago's World Columbian Exposition. 
Wow, so it was a pretty big deal then. Now, do we still have it somewhere? Can we see it? Possibly. I do know that today you can find several of her paintings at the Smithsonian Institute. Wow, so she has managed to get herself into the official history. Yes, though it should be noted that the Institute's collection is vast and most things are not on display at any given time. Also, keep in mind, she was still playing society wife to appease Albert. That meant rounds of teas, balls, and social calls. I love that, like, little little rhyming thing there. So she's doing her part. What about Albert? He was cheating and descending into alcoholism. Oh, par for the course, yeah. And of course he accused Alice of having an affair. Of course he did. There's no evidence that she did, but there was yet another argument. This sort of happening continued until Albert's death. That really is rough. And now, as we all know, her eldest daughter, Natalie, was constantly a rebel, even as a teenager. But her second daughter, Laura, was rebelling in her own way. Mm -hmm. It should be noted that Laura was always viewed as the more obedient and quiet of the two sisters. Yeah, in that she didn't try to seduce half of Paris. She did do that. She also never caused problems growing up, except for the time she hit her sister in the head with a shovel as a toddler. Except that. Yes, but she herself was also a toddler. Mm -hmm. Natalie would carry a small scar on her forehead from that incident. Now, aside from that. Now, Laura was not quite an accomplice to her sister's romance in Leanne de Prugy, one of the top courtesans of Paris. But she was well aware of the affair and helped carry out some of Natalie's schemes to get away from their parents without either knowing the truth. Oh, so she's a good ally, at least. There was also her exploration of the Baha'i faith, a new religion about the unity of all people and accepting the validity of the well-known religions of the world, whose founders and central figures are seen as manifestations of God. Ooh, now how did she come across this? She was introduced to it in 1900 when living in Paris with her family and studying dramatic arts and sculpture. Were they, like, missionaries? Not really. It was a society woman who introduced her to it. Ah, fair enough. The same society woman would introduce her future husband to it. Huh, so this is just... A society woman who's really into the Baha'i faith. As Laura herself would become, because she accepted the religion quite quickly and made a pilgrimage to Akka in Palestine. When she returned to Paris, she became an active participant in the city's Baha'i community. What does that mean? Is there, like, a church? Do you, like, go there at different times? No, it appears to have just been the social rounds with people involved with the faith. Mm, So it's more like religious discussion rather than like religious services? It sounds like it. Hmm. In the meantime, Alice put her painting skills to use, illustrating her eldest daughter's first book of poetry. It turns out several of the female models were her daughter's lovers, but Alice's blinders were firmly on until Albert ripped them off when he bought up every copy and the book plates before destroying them in 1900. No, Albert, come on! That threw a wrench in the relationship with her oldest daughter. That is rough, yeah. No, because you do, you do know people like that who are, like, low-key homophobic, but they'll ignore it if, they aren't, if, it, if it isn't, like, shoved right in their face, as they would put it. Yes, and Alice greatly struggled with realizing her daughter was a lesbian, despite the fact that she had a live-and-let-live mentality. Just don't ask, don't tell, and she had been told. In a way, yes. Uh, things were strained for a time, but they would always be close throughout the rest of their lives. Well, that's good, at least. I'm, I'm glad there isn't some kind of dramatic expulsion going on. No, there isn't. There's probably several more blow-ups with Albert, though. Mm-hmm. At about the same time, her daughter, Laura, introduced her to the Baha'i faith. Now, they had both converted, and Alice joined her on another pilgrimage. Albert was not amused. Yeah, I was gonna say, how can this man continue to cause problems? 
He was furious, in fact, when Alice let a group stay in their Washington house during a visit to D.C. I mean, they have enough rooms, right? What was it, 26 or something? That was their summer cottage in Maine. Right, their their cottage. Sorry, their cottage with 26 rooms. But no, that's such a such small quarters, I'm sure, that they have, though, in, in Washington. We'll just say they had plenty of room. Mm-hmm. The media of Washington, though, was not very charitable when learning of their change of religion. They considered it the family's latest fad. Were there a lot of Baha'i people in the U.S. at that time? I mean, even now, I don't know too many people who are Baha'i. I very much doubt it. It was a very young religion. And from what I understand, Laura was part of really bringing it more into the U.S., yeah, so I bet she was not happy about um, the media putting this. Oh, she on. very much was not. Mm-hmm. She was disdainful of the ignorance it revealed, but she tolerated it. And then Albert died in 1902. Mm-hmm. Life goes on. <laughs> it really does. As he died in France, he was cremated in Paris, and his ashes returned to the U.S. Laura was 23 at the time, and. At 45, Alice was finally free after 26 years. What does she do? She proceeded to buy a new house and set about having a salon and amateur theatrics in D.C. Mm-hmm. Love it. Put as many people as you want in your house. She co-wrote a play with Natalie. She threw charity events for the families of dead sailors when the battleship Missouri blew up. She also got four patents in the next few years. Ooh, an inventor. Yes, two for improvements to clothing wardrobes and parlor chairs. One for fastening chairs together in an alignment for rows. And the fourth for an automatic stirring device known as a fluid agitator. Wow, I love that these are all things related to, like, being a society wife, you know, and, and like, having sentiments and whatever, you know, that she is, like thought to herself, you know, there's something that could make this easier, and then she went about and did it. Yes, but the patents were just a side hobby when compared to her art. Which she can pursue in peace without that lump. Yes, Laura, meanwhile, moved with her mother to D.C., into Studio House, as it was called, but still spent time in Paris, where she met Hippolyte Dreyfus, Like Laura, he was introduced to the Baha'i faith by a society woman in 1900. A Frenchman six years her senior, he had studied law and was practicing before the Paris Court of Appeals. Fancy sort of guy. He is, but he then gave up his legal career to devote himself to Oriental studies, comparative religion, Arabic, and Persian, with the intention to translate the Baha'i writings. So, Laura now... You said she was 26? Um, or no, she's 23 now. Her mother married a lot younger. Had there been any hint of marriage before this? Before meeting Hippolyte? I don't think there was nearly as much because Albert spent a great deal of time trying to get her older sister to marry into the British aristocracy. Oddly specific, but all right. Keep in mind, this is the era of the million dollar princesses. Mm -hmm. Now, Laura and he would travel throughout the Middle East. In Tehran, Laura sent a letter to her mother stating that the believers there were wonderfully sincere and kind, and they were among the most important people of Persia. She spent most of the next few years traveling through the region. Wow, do we have any stories from there? Unfortunately, her diaries and notes were lost during the Nazi occupation of France in World War II. (laughs) So we don't get many of her own words about her experiences. Those dang Nazis. We do know that she became quite fluent in Persian and wrote a book of interviews with the head of the religion. So she really got into this Baha'i thing. She really did. Meanwhile, at some point, Alice met Christian Hemmick, the son of the ambassador to Switzerland, through her theatricals. He was 22. She was 52. It was love at first sight. For both of them? Yes. All right. 
Good for them. No one in their social circle suspected a thing. Even when she kept him late for rehearsals, portrayed him as a Greek god in her paintings, and allowed him to accompany her to social functions. Not even when she kissed him during a play. So they weren't being subtle. They were not being subtle at all. <laughs> did this lead anywhere for them, or did they keep it under wraps? Oh, we shall return to them. But in the meantime, we have a different scandal. Oh. Laura is still sculpting when she's not traveling, and she ships one of her works to her mother in D.C. in 1910. Mm-hmm. The work was a nude woman reclining with one arm under her head. Now, it was made of plaster and cement, so the caretaker needed to sprinkle it with water each day and cover it with canvas as it was outside on the lawn. Mm -hmm. However, that October, the wind pushed the canvas cover right off. Keep in mind, at the time, there were state legislations requiring clothing on nude statues in museums. Wow, this was a really repressive era then. Yes, and someone called the newspapers. And mm -hmm. next thing you know, there's tour guides with megaphones out on the sidewalk talking about all the interesting things they could think of in relation to the statue. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they could think of a lot. This was not helped by the gossip saying Natalie was the model for it. <clears throat> Ooh, look at Natalie Barney naked. Though, as Natalie would complain in letters later, that stupid statue of my sister's that is neither a representation of art nor of myself. So it wasn't even really her. It was not, but everyone thought so. Mm -hmm. Well, because God forbid a woman artist actually do something like that, that, is, that transcends um, a physical thing. I mean, there's, there's this idea that men do art and women do craft and women can never go beyond the corporeal. So if a woman makes art, it must be based strictly exactly on real life. Yes, but there's also the idea of men as the artist and women as the muse. Right. And yeah, definitely. Um, she was, she was breaking a few stereotypes and expectations there. Yes, and Natalie was already quite scandalous on her own. Mm-hmm. I'm sure she was. Now, the new year rolls around, and there is even more scandal. Mm-hmm. In 1911, Alice married Christian in Paris in a double wedding with her daughter and Hippolyte. It was complete mayhem in the newspapers. Everyone saw Christian as a gold digger. This despite the fact Alice gave her fortune to her daughters to prevent that said image. Well, but no, we know that no one can ever have an intergenerational relationship without it being about money. I mean, obviously, unless the woman's younger, then it's fine and we don't care. As we saw in Leanne de Pugy's episode, this is not an era of milf loving. Evidently not, tragically. However, neither daughter was happy at getting a stepfather who was younger than them. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. For reference, Christian was eight years younger than Laura. Mm -hmm. And in fact, she thought he was nothing more than a gigolo. Oh no! Of course, things were not helped when newspapers decided to inflate Alice's age to 61 and brandish such headlines as Elderly Widow Marries Boy. Wow! They're really laying it on thick. Yes, and of course, the other scandal was that Laura and her husband combined their last names with a hyphen to form Dreyfus Barney. Right, how how dare they? It's the feminists are destroying civilization. Yes, and it wouldn't have been the only scandalous thing as the marriage is thought to have been unconsummated. Huh. So, it, do we know more about this? Um... There are ideas that Laura might have been asexual. Hmm. Do we know about Hippolyte? Either he was also asexual, or he didn't mind. Mm hmm Wow. That's... If it was true, which we don't know, but that, that would be really sweet and good. And I, I hope for the sake of asexuals today that they can find themselves in this couple. 
Yes. But then came World War One. Ugh. As it always must. As we saw in her own episode, Natalie did go and really do much outside of hosting pacifistic salon meetings. Go on, what did Laura do? Laura is the only one of her family to take an active role in helping the war effort. Mm -hmm. She would serve in the American Ambulance Corps as a night nurse in Paris from 1914 to 1915, and then in the American Red Cross from 1916 to 1918 in France. She then helped to establish the first children's hospital in Avignon, in 1918. Wow. Is this, like, related to being Baha'i, or is this just kind of how she is? Do we know? I think it's just kind of how she is. Wow. Well, she's certainly doing her part. Yes, and consequently, she was named a chevalier and later an officer of the French Legion of Honor. Meanwhile, her husband served with the French army and survived. As for Alice, she had her own troubles to worry about. During the course of the war, her second marriage deteriorated. The newspapers continued to attack them, the differences in their ages, and his idle lifestyle. Yeah, I can imagine with all that strain, they were not holding up as well. It was also not helped by reports of him sending scented letters to male friends. Interesting. By 1919, she'd separated from Christian over his involvement with a young male actor. And she was already thinking of divorce when Natalie arrived on her honeymoon with Lily de Gramont on their way to Niagara Falls. So so they could get divorced now? Was it A, was it more socially acceptable, or B, did she just not care? It was both more socially acceptable and also having endured one terrible marriage and with the counsel of her daughters, I imagine she was more like, fuck it, I'm not going through this again. Yeah, good on her. So she paid Christian $10,000 to end the marriage. They divorced in 1920. The newspapers were all over that too, so for a time she decamped to Paris. Of course the newspapers were all about it. They just can't leave this woman alone. They can't seem to leave any of the Barney women alone. Mm -hmm. She then moved to Hollywood in 1924 bought a Persian cat, and continued throwing theatric entertainments. Her house attracted many from the burgeoning film industry, including Cecil B. DeMille and Charlie Chaplin. By the time of the 1929 stock market crash and onset of the Great Depression, Alice had bought a theater. It was a money-sucking venture, and Alice was not as wealthy as she had been. But she was into it. I mean, it sounds like something that you do not for the money, but for the passion of it. Yes, and don't get me wrong, she was still managing quite well. Mm -hmm. And the theater received glowing reviews. In September 1931, she had her ballet played at the Hollywood Bowl, and she was looking forward to overlapping visits with her daughters. During a night out a performance, she felt weak and sat down. She was dead within minutes on the night of October 12, 1931. At 74, she was buried with her sister in Dayton, though Albert's grave is nearby. On the one hand, it sounds like her life was cut short just as she was, you know, on an upswing. But on the other hand, I'm so glad that unlike a lot of people we've talk about, talked about, she has, you know, she she is doing what she loves. She is not declining into loneliness and sadness. She's still, you know, she, she has her family who support her and she has friends. And she went out a high point. Yeah. So thank goodness for that. Unfortunately for Laura, the end of the Roaring Twenties proved a time of death. Her husband also died after a slow and painful illness. That's rough. How did, What does she do after this? How does she get out of it? Friends said she faded quite a bit after her husband died. However, prior to World War II, she's still quite involved with different organizations. So she is a member of the International Council of Women, a women's rights organization that is still active today. She was even its representative to the League of Nations during the interwar years. And she was also the only woman appointed by the League Council to sit on the Subcommittee of Experts on Education. So she was doing impressive things. Yes, and then with the outbreak of World War II, she represented the National Council of Women of the 
United States on its Coordinating Committee for Better Racial Understanding. She also established a portraiture prize in her mother's name for the Society of Washington Artists annual exhibition and arranged several retrospectives of her work. Wow. So she is she is putting in the work to make a better world, both in terms of helping disadvantaged people and helping people um, figure out their way in the world, but also keeping alive her mother's memory. Yes, and still moving in high-level circles. The first retrospective was held in 1941 and attended by then-First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. Wow. During World War II itself, she was a delegate of the French National Committee on Women to the Commission on Racial Affairs. And also, her hyphenated name and her long-dead husband was of great use to her sister who decided to stay in Europe during the entire time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which you can get more detail on if you listen to our episode on that. Yes, but short summary, Natalie escapes a Nazi hands by her housekeeper basically turning an interrogation into, oh, you must mean her sister who married a Jewish man. Mm -hmm. When Laura returned to Paris after the war, she found many possessions had been looted, including her unpublished memoirs and notes from her trips to the Middle East. Nice! <laughs> Oof. Yeah. Dude, how does she recover from that? I mean, does she try to rewrite things, or? It doesn't appear that she tried to, because we don't have any notes, really. Mm -hmm. And things do get quieter for her. With her sister, she donated her mother's house and paintings to the Smithsonian, though the house is now the embassy for Latvia in Washington, D.C. Her sister died in Paris in 1972. She herself was plagued by rheumatism, though her mind was as sharp as ever. She died in 1974 at the age of 94, and is buried in a plot with her sister in France. Well, at least they were together at the end. Though that was not the initial plan, if you've listened to some of our other episodes. Especially after the courtesans who had kind of um, unfortunate relationships with their families. It, it is good to see, in this family at least, that they were able to stay strong despite all sorts of terrible things happening from media frenzies to, you know, various scandals and personal upheavals and relationship traumas. Thank you for listening. Follow us on Twitter. Subscribe. And remember, if you break your toe bathing in the sea with a mad Englishman, follow his advice when he carries you across the beach.